Now more than ever, you need technology you can rely on. I'm a Dell Technologies advisor. Ich auch. And if you're a small business, we're with you. We are with you. Estamos com você. We want to help. So we'll be right here. At home. Answering your calls. Providing support. And standing by you. Every step of the way. Bye-bye. I'd like to introduce our Diversity on Boards panel. We've got a real treat ahead for you. Um, so first, I'd like to uh, introduce Anjali Bansal. Anjali Bansal is the founder of Avana Capital, a platform that invests in and supports the scaling up of startups. She's also the chairperson of Investment Council of Niti Aayog's FinTech and Women Entrepreneurship Platform. Anjali is an active contributor to the dialogue on corporate governance and diversity. She co-founded and chaired the FICCI Center for Com Corporate Governance Program for Women on Corporate Boards. She's a charter member of Thai, serves on the managing committee of the Indian Venture Capital Association, is a mentor to Facebook, she leads tech, and at the IOG's Atal Innovation Mission. She has been listed as one of the most powerful women in Indian business by India's leading publication, Business Today, and by Fortune India. She's a frequent speaker at forums like, well, at like Harvard, Stanford, and Columbia University. Welcome, Anjali. Next, I'd like to introduce Deepthi Jaggi, who is an expert at transforming businesses through technology and advanced analytics. Her experience includes serving as president and chief marketing officer of Clinacos Inc., a Silicon Valley company, at the forefront of applying AI and digital technologies to healthcare and life sciences. Dipti has also served as an advisor to multiple venture capital and private equity firms, including TPG Capital. Her prior work experience ex includes more than a decade of increasing responsibilities at Johnson & Johnson, Genentech, Kaiser Permanente, and Oracle. Dipti is on the board of TechCU and also currently serves as a co-chair of Stanford Women on Boards. She has a doctor's of pharma pharmacology from University of Southern California and an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Welcome, Deepthi. Dr. Chimin Bolin is a CEO, is CEO and president of Paritas Partners, Inc., an analytics platform and valuation accelerator leveraging tech, AI, data analytics, cybersecurity resolution, and digital transformation and marketing. Prior, she was VP of IBM, and held CMO, CRO, and M&A partner positions at growth companies. She serves as board of director of BMC Stock Holdings and the Tech Cybersecurity Lead. Her previous board experience includes six corporate boards across Canada, Europe, and US in connected med medical devices, health, mobile, internet, SaaS, cloud infrastructure, and is the audit chair of two US public company. Tina, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Great, thank you. And um, we're just making sure that Deeply can get into the room, but um, it's a real pleasure to uh, join you, Anjali and Chiman, on this topic that um, is a really important one, both here in Silicon Valley, also in India, and uh, more broadly globally. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to a lively discussion with our distinguished panelists and board members. We're going to focus on three topics. The first one will be board service in public, private, and nonprofit organizations. We'll turn next to the importance of diversity and inclusion on boards. And then we'll cover board governance, governance during the COVID-19 and racial justice crisis that is occurring right now. And I think, you know, as I think about each of you, Chiman and Anjali and Deepthi, you have a different lens with which you bring, um, you know, a perspective to this particular topic as investors, advisors, and board members. Um, your residents of California and India, both jurisdictions that have had recent legislation for women on boards, including quotas and types of board members um, as well. And so as we, we turn to begin the panel here, um, and we'll first talk about board service in public, private, and nonprofit organizations. And um, we'll begin probably with you, Anjali. And you know, my question is, as you think about your journey um, in India and the journey for women on boards that began actually before the journey began with the legislation here in California, 
Um, you know, what lessons uh, can you provide from your work with the Women Entrepreneurship Platform and the board matching program um, that you told us about? Tina and Ty, Silicon Valley, thank you very much for having me here with you today. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Um, it's great to see some old friends and make some new ones in Thai. And I've actually been a charter member of Thai Mumbai for the last 20 years. So it's, it's really very much being part of an old friend circle. Um, Tina, my first board actually was a not-for-profit board in the microfinance space about 15 years ago. I stayed with that board for many years, eventually chaired it, Women's World Banking, a very, it's a leading microfinance institution. Um, that was before there was actually an active dialogue on board diversity anywhere really, in India or in the West. And then since then, particularly I think in the last decade and even more so in the last sort of five years, there has been a much more active and conscious focus on board diversity. So you asked me specifically about the, both the Women Entrepreneurship Platform as well as Women on Corporate Boards. So India passed the Companies Act 2013, but even before that came in, we knew that there is a need to have more women on boards. And uh, it, it is sometimes not really intentional that women are excluded or were excluded. Thankfully now there is legislation in other parts of the world. Norway actually was the uh, trailblazer in putting out a 40% requirement for women on public boards. Um, but the issue was there was a mythical sort of fallacious belief that there aren't enough women, that there is a supply problem. And so rather than sort of saying, let's collect data and show there is no supply problem, we actually said, let us show you that it's a discovery problem, not a supply numbers problem. The Women on Corporate Boards program, really, we, we put together a mentorship program. We actively recruited and got the help of the top board members in India, uh, the BSE 100 chairman, lead independent directors. And when we, anybody we asked the question, would you want a woman on your board? They said, absolutely. They said, why do you not have one? Because we don't know any. As we said, we'll show you. And the mentorship program today, is, I, I, I'm very happy to report, and its success is no longer required. Today, the number of women on boards in India, the percentage has gone from about 4.5% to almost close to 20% partly supported by legislation and partly because it's a flywheel that has now gathered momentum. So I'll pause there, but can answer more questions. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And you know, while we're, um, hopefully people will join us, I'll also just comment on the parallel path, right? Because um, you know, I've been engaged with her on um, Stanford Women on Boards, and I think all four of us are somehow affiliated with the Stanford University. Yeah. And it's been fun, right, to listen to your journey there um, in Mumbai and compare it to the journey that Deepthi has taken as chair, um, you know, of the board of, of Stanford Women on Boards and, you know, the programs that they put in place. I think they're just a, a few years behind you. And I think there's a lot of lessons um, to be learned in terms of um, the work that you did around board matching to be able to identify, right, the talent that does exist and really make it available to the boards that are are looking for them. Um, now, as we turn a little bit towards public board service at uh, Chimin, you know, I think we talked about, you serve on a variety of different boards. I think you mentioned maybe six, um, and including, included in some of those are some international board experiences. And just wanted to ask if you could please, um, um, you know, both share with us your board service on public companies and then maybe specifically with respect to international boards. I'd be happy to. Uh, Tina, it is my absolute pleasure and honor to be part of this Thai program. I remember, gosh, more than 15 years ago, there used to only be maybe 100 of us. And then a couple of years later, we were at the convention center. So how much it has grown. So thank you so much. Um, so I have served as board of director for companies in the US, listed on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, and Canada and Europe. And with the globalization of business operations investments, I've discovered that we have a lot more opportunities out there for us, either on two different kinds of boards. One, boards of foreign companies and boards of domestic companies in the U.S. that have the majority of assets and operations outside uh, the U.S. So if we focus on the first one, let's say if you want to be, I'd say, a global uh, a globe-trotting board of director on either sides of the ocean, 
One thing you want to realize, and I have, as I've been on both U.S. and non-U.S. boards, there are very much unique challenges. There's some similarities and there are some differences. Some of the similarities, whether you're on a board in the U.S. or outside the U.S., you have two fiduciary responsibilities. One is oversight monitoring and control of management functions. And two, setting the strategic direction with oversight. But the routes may be different. For boards in the U.S., um, uh, for boards outside the U.S., there are some differences. One, as we all know, cultural differences. And also one thing you ought to be aware of and do your due diligence, there's country-specific differences as it relates to, let's say, governance, laws, regulations, liabilities, local compliance controls, expectations of your roles and responsibilities. Even though we have something called OECD, which is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development since the 1999s, we find out there's still unique differences by locality. So take note of that if you wanna be on a board outside the US. In addition to the cultural differences and I'd say the country specific differences, there's also board structure differences. Um, many of them, for example, have what they call a two-tier board structure, where they separate the supervisory and the monetary and executive roles. An example, for example, of differences for some boards outside the U.S. is employees get representation and term limits. But I really uh, like all of us on this call to take advantage of don't, all, don't look at just U.S.-based companies, especially for those in Silicon Valley. They are yearning to have our set of optics and perspectives for those boards which are outside of the U.S. So thank you for asking that question, Tina. Yeah, no, I appreciate that perspective. Um, hi, VP, and we'll, we'll um, have a chance to introduce you in just a minute um, and come back maybe to the topic we were talking about earlier, but happy you could join us. Um, you know, I think, Chiman, as I think about, you know, the international experience and the country level difference, maybe we'll turn to you next, Anjali, to talk about your public board service um, in India. I think it ranges from you know, various industries and in financial services to logistics to, I, I believe, pharmaceuticals. If you could share a little bit about your experience and contrast you know, the India experience maybe with the international, um, that would be terrific. Sure. So my boards, as you were describing, Tina, actually do span from, I've, I've chaired a public sector bank and I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm very stressed public sector bank at that point as well. I sit on the board of an asset management company, um, India's largest technology enabled logistics company, um, the largest independent power company in India as well, consumer durables, consumer, and pharma, GSK, and, and engineering in Siemens. So between Tata and Kotak, I think I probably covered sort of some of the best governance companies in India. Lots to learn. <laughs> learned a lot from the amazing chairman and other board members one has worked with. And much like a lot you learn as an executive, there is very little that board training actually gives you beyond manuals and you know, audit committee has these TORs and the nominations and remuneration committee, committee has certain requirements. A lot of what you learn is actually apprenticing with terrific other board colleagues. Uh, that said, the role of the board has become a lot more formal over the last few years. Both regulatory, legal, as well as fiduciary obligations are a lot heavier. Boards are spending a lot more time on very, very substantive issues around strategy, risk management, capital allocation. And I think one of the most important functions of a board is beyond oversight and compliance really is, uh, is talent and uh, making sure that your enterprise is future-proof when it comes to digital. And I know we'll talk a bit more about COVID, so I'll keep that for later. But uh, across all these boards, I would say that the one, while the industries are very diverse, what is consistent is there is a commitment to good governance that goes beyond the rule book. It's beyond the letter of governance, it's actually the spirit of governance. It's uh, protecting the interests of not just the minority shareholders, which is, again, it's one of those popular prevalent views that the role of the board is to prevent the, to protect the interests of the minority shareholder. In fact, most progressive boards today, we believe that our role is to look after the interests of not just all shareholders, but all stakeholders. 
the communities we operate in, our customers, our vendors, our supply chain employees, and certainly the shareholders as well. I chair a couple of CSR committees. I chair several nominations and rem committees, and I serve on audit committees. And I think, again, the consistent theme across all of them is there is an attention to detail. Uh, we work with our companies in helping them actually keep coming up the curve, as it were, on presenting the right information. See, as independent board members, you re it's the, the role of the board and the role of the independent director. Are you a, uh, are you a watchdog or are you a bloodhound? Right? You, there's, there's so much liability these days. And the true role is of neither. If you need, to, at, at best, you should be a watchdog. If you have to be a bloodhound, then there is something wrong. And there is so much debate and so much discussion right now around um, what is going wrong with companies and there's uh, across the board, right? So it's across a spectrum of issues, wrongdoing, malfeasance is at the extreme end. And at the best end is good succession planning, good governance, good risk management, and somewhere along the ways, adopting technology, being digital, being future-proof. Um, so yes, yeah, so. Terrific. I, I appreciate that perspective. It's, I mean, really interesting to think about. And, you know, can, can I add one point, Tina? That Please, we, yeah. Since we are talking about gender and diversity and inclusion, I think the other consistent theme um, in all my years of experience as a board member is actually when you enter a boardroom, you should check your gender in at the door. Because neither the letter nor the spirit of governance uh, differentiates on gender. So while definitely you know, one has so often been the only woman in the room when in a board, um, one should not ever keep one's voice down or up for that matter. But it really doesn't matter when you're a board member, your obligations, your duties, your responsibilities are uh, independent of gender. I like that. You know, I think oftentimes we talk um, in diversity, equity and inclusion about what are the expectations of a woman or a minority in terms of voice and keeping it neither up nor down and checking it at the door, I think is a uh, good advice. Um, VP, I'm so glad that you've joined us. You know, as we transition from the perspective that Chiman brought on international boards to the India perspective from Anjali, let's talk a little bit about uh, the US and the, the local board um, that's public that you are have recently joined. Um, I'd love to hear about, you know, how did they find you? And then if we can circle back a little bit to your work on Stanford Women on Boards, I did a bit of a preview in the beginning, but would love to hear, you know, maybe how uh, the board matching program is going. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so my, how did text you? So I, I serve on uh, uh, multiple boards. I serve on, I've served on uh, private company boards, nonprofit boards, recently got to join TechCU, which is from a fiduciary duty perspective in terms of sort of just numbers, uh, the largest board I serve on. So it's very excited to be there. I joined in January. TechCU, as some may know, is a local, uh, you know, it's the headquartered in San Jose. Uh, we are, um, you know, over 3 billion in assets, 125,000 members, 5,400 branches across the United States through our branch network. Um, so TechCU is a pretty innovative credit union. Um, they've been doing really interesting things, growing like crazy. We were the third top performing credit union in the US. And um, what I hear is, what I understand is they were looking for someone who could really help with the digital transformation of the business. So employing some artificial intelligence, digital transformation, we pride ourselves in member services. So uh, we literally are, as a part of our credo is, we want to wow our members, uh, right? Wow in all capital letters, actually. And so they were looking for someone, um, not necessarily gender diversity, but just anyone who could bring digital transformation. Uh, one of the board members is actually, circling back to Stanford Women on Boards, is a member of Stanford Women on Boards, and I'll talk about SWB in a minute, but she, I think, knew of me because I chair Stanford Women on Boards and kind of knew of my digital experience as well, and, and reached out to see if I was interested, and uh, basically that kind of led me to serving on the board. So that's uh, TechCU. Uh, it's been an amazing experience uh, coming on to this board. Stanford Women on Boards uh, has been around uh, for 11 years. 
Um, it, it's a group that is uh, sponsored by Stanford University, the Graduate School of Business and the Rock Center of Corporate Governance. Uh, you know, all the research that comes out of the Rock Center of Corporate Governance, I mean, uh, the um, diversity actually has been very important. If you look at just data alone, uh, diverse boards uh, perform better, uh, companies with diverse boards perform better on any of the stock index measures that we've looked at uh, in the United States. Uh, as you may know uh, already, um, the CEO of Goldman Sachs recently announced uh, earlier this year that they refused to take a company public uh, IPO unless they have at least one woman on the board. Um, so awareness of diversity on boards has been going up um, over these 11 years. I think when SWB was started, diversity on boards was a new topic. It happened to be started by women, so it became Stanford Women on Boards. Uh, but we're obviously very interested in diversity uh, Late a uh, couple of years ago, or Governor Jerry Brown signed into law uh, SB 826, which is a, a bill in California that mandates a certain ratio for uh, board service uh, to include women. And what was really telling was the letter he signed when he signed this into law, where he said, uh, corporations have enjoyed status. So corporations are persons, right, in our, in our legal system. And so he said, it's time that these corporations that have enjoyed status of persons uh, represent the persons of the United States, which is over over 50% women. And I just love the way he wrote that in. Um, and so SWB has kind of geared up in the last couple of years. I took on uh, as chair last year. I've served on the leadership team for eight years now. Um, and when we took on, um, SB 26 was law. So we are doing various activities. Um, you know, we're trying to dispel this notion that Yes, it's mandated, but there really are no qualified women to fit these roles. We believe that's absolutely incorrect and that they are, we ourselves have a thousand members who have board, who are either board ready or have board service under their belts already. So we have kind of started a matching service. We are doing active outreach to California companies who need female board members. We are offering our service to them for free. Uh, where you know they give us a spec. We, we're partnering with search firms like Russell Reynolds, um, where basically the idea is if you have a board spec, bring it to us. We will look at our membership and suggest a slate, but we're also doing educational initiatives. We are partnering with uh, private equity firms. So TPG Capital is a strong supporter. Uh, Jim Coulter personally works with us. Uh, he's, he's that committed. Um, and so that's kind of been the work. We've been very busy uh, since, the, since the law passed. Thank you, Deepi, for that overview. I think, um, you know, I, I've watched you kind of taking leadership of this organization at a time that's been incredibly busy. So it was especially rewarding to hear the story that uh, you joined this recent board through a connection on women, uh, Stanford Women on Board. So terrific. Um, thank you. As you know, we transition maybe to the, the importance of diversity and inclusion on boards. We'll maybe talk about diversity separately from inclusion and then may, maybe close with the the business case in this section. And, you know, Deepi, I'll, I'll ask you this question um, regarding the Technology Credit Union Board. You mentioned you're going through a board search right now, and there are certain processes that you're using to manage uh, slate diversity. You could tell us a little bit about that approach. I think, you know, it's one that, you know, at Russell Reynolds, we're paying close attention to and being made lots of requests for, especially given the environment and curious to learn how you're approaching it. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so uh, Tech CEO board is actually very forward thinking. I have to say I'm, I'm very uh, fortunate to be a part of this board. We are 11 uh, member board four are women already, so I'm not the first woman, I'm the fourth woman. Uh, and uh, two of us actually in context of Thai, two board members are Indian descent. Um, so that's it, both of us are tech focused, right? Um, but um, as we're looking for a new board member, what's important to the TechSU board is diversity of thought, right? So how can we get, uh, and so then diverse, diversity in how we look is just a way of getting diversity of thought, right? So we have a lot of uh, kind of inherent uh, culture within the board of the fact that, um, you know, all thoughts are welcome. 
I mean, you just kind of feel that as a new board member going in. That kind of translates to the slate. So when we've talked, it's not, we don't have formal quotas on the board. We haven't said, well, we definitely want a person of color or we definitely want a woman. We are definitely interested in the skill set. But in doing that, we're casting our um, uh, net quite wide. So, you know, reaching out to SWB, uh, there are certain, certain other diversity organizations. I'll talk later about how SWB is partnering with the Black Alumni Association at Stanford. So we're looking at a diverse pool of candidates, but we are not placing quotas. What we're doing is we're saying, we're just open to diversity of thought and whoever has the right qualifications, but also has an aspect of diversity uh, would be sort of, you know, a, a preferred way for us to go. Great. Um... So let's think a little bit about um, inclusion as well. You mentioned earlier, Anjali, that uh, you were the uh, only female when you were the board chair of Dina Bank. Um, and you know, my question is just around how did you go about fostering diversity, sorry, inclusion of the diverse perspectives at the table? Um, and I think you talk a lot about being a beneficiary. I would love to hear how you paid forward what you've uh, been able to learn from others as well. Terrific. Uh, thanks for the cue, Tina. So having been a beneficiary, and I think it, it goes without saying that for many women of our generation, a lot of our sponsors, mentors, champions are men because there actually weren't that many women. So um, having learned the right way of running a board and seeing how the tone from the top really set the culture in the board. And uh, and whether you're a, as a young woman, you do need sometimes to have folks make space for you. But it is done in such a smooth, effortless way. And that's what I took into Dena Bank as well, of course, many, many years later, not as a young woman at all. Um, the point being that everybody who's around the board table is there because they have something to offer and to contribute. And in some ways, it is part of the role of the board chair to get the best out of her board members. So in the context of a public sector bank in India, you, um, you know, there are representatives from the Reserve Bank, the Central Bank, from the government, uh, from the finance ministry, there are public sector direct, public interest directors, and of course, executive directors who represent the bank's management. Um, and so there's quite a set of uh, different points of view. So the easy thing to do is to let some dominant voices just speak and uh, let the stereotype play out, so to speak. But when I got in to the room, the both sort of the literal and the figurative room, I realized that there is such a wealth of experience um, around the table. So someone who's been a regulator from the Reserve Bank brings such tremendous richness of experience and situations and risks that he has seen and mitigated and managed. The public interest directors, one of them was a technology expert, uh, the other was an HR expert. And then even leveraging our ministerial and the government representatives in the right way to understand policy and to really bridge that gap between Mumbai and Delhi, so to speak, which is sort of the New York Washington gap or the Silicon Valley Washington gap, right? So making sure everybody gets the chance to speak, taking the time to let everyone and actually inviting people to speak if they're not speaking up. And I think that is the role of the board chair. But we led, it led to a very productive set of conversations, lots of problem solving. We, because it was a stressed bank, the board really had to pull together to resolve it. Um, and it worked. And I have experienced this, by the way, in a lot of my other boards as well, where uh, good board chairs make sure everyone gets to speak and they speak last. Yeah, I think, you know, earlier we talked about uh, the topic of inclusion and how to develop inclusive leadership skills. I think truly it's important for the board chair to exhibit those skills to draw out uh, the diversity of perspectives so that the board does not get uh, stuck in a group think mode, um, which can happen, right, especially at stressful times like these. Um, so appreciate that perspective. And, you know, the question that I often get asked is, you know, is this a nice to have or is there a real business case for diversity and inclusion on boards? And Shiman, I think, you know, my question for you, you, I think, are serving on many non and gov committees, maybe chairing them as well. What is your perspective on the business case for diversity and inclusion on boards? Actually, thank you for asking that question. If I think about it, um, 
before diversity many years ago, probably especially seven, eight years ago, diversity belonged in the HR department. And yes, HR should be get involved, but if you really want to have good diversity, it, the managers who look at individual contributors, who look at people managers, who look at directors, who look at executives, who look at the CEO and the direct reports and the board, they all need to embrace diversity. It makes good business sense. If you look at your customer and if you have a diverse candidate, he or she will understand and can relate to that customer so you can grow. And also we all know there's so many research that says diversification will improve decision-making and results. But in my opinion, there's different kind of diversity. There's social diversity. There's, we've talked about gender, we've talked about race, we've talked about ethnicity, um, there's age diversity and there's professional diversity. And so I can't stress enough, it makes good business sense, but only if the diverse members' perspectives are, regu are regularly elicited and valued. Um, in my opinion, you ought to have what I would co consider an egalitarian culture. And we talked a little bit about this before, one that elevates the different voices, integrates contrasting insights, and welcomes conversation about diversity. If you look at the majority of the boards now, and I've sat on three non-gov committees, the board still is relatively homogeneous in many sense. And we talked about it before, you know, one kind of diversity, gender diversity, was the California law that we talked about. Um, where they have to have at least one female director by 2020. But these kind of things, if you look at Europe, we are behind the eight ball. Norway, Spain, France, Iceland, they have all have laws requiring that women comprise at least 40% of board that publicly listed companies. So the challenge, I believe, is to elevate and to make sure the diversity is directly linked to a business case of growth. It makes good business sense. And also, our challenge, if it's important enough, and if you click that up enough, I think what we still need to do, the work ahead, is to make sure we measure and compensate diversity at the board level when it looks at the CEO's uh, profile and what it, we expect he or she to do. It's important that we put a metric around. Yeah, it's um, a conversation we're having with many boards today who are getting involved in the accountability, right, associated yeah. with driving diversity within the organizations. So the perspective is an interesting one how, you know, diversity used to sit within HR and now it's really sitting at the board level. So thank you for that. I wanted to acknowledge that there is a question that has come in from the audience and we're going to um, finish our last section before opening up uh, questions to the audience. And so thank you for that. Please do keep uh, adding your questions to the to the panel here. Um, let's turn to board governance during COVID-19 and the racial justice crisis. Um, you know, with the murder of George Floyd and, and others, you know, surrounding May 25th, um, you know, Deepa, you mentioned that you're partnering with um, a number of different organizations, including the Black uh, Alumni Association. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, that partnership and how you might go about addressing and approaching the issue of racial justice in the US. Absolutely, thank you for the question. So as I was mentioning, Stanford Women on Board is obviously focused on gender diversity, but first we're interested in diversity on boards. We work off of uh, pretty uh, uh, proven business criteria that on the S&P 500, um, you know, companies that have diverse boards perform better. Um, and so uh, even before sort of the recent crisis, right, we've been partnering with other organizations. So we partner with Quorum, for example, um, with their focus on LGBTQ um, diversity on boards. Um, and so our, our interest has been while, while we always promoting sort of gender diversity and, and our members who are all women uh, for boards, uh, we partner with these other organizations. Um, you know, as you know, Tina, from a diversity and inclusion perspective, the role you play at Russell Reynolds, I know we've had conversations around this topic. Um, so now most recently, um, we had actually pre this event sort of started reaching out to more uh, alumni groups across Stanford. 
uh, to kind of spread the word of more diversity. And uh, with the with the recent events of the mur murder of George Floyd and all the awareness that has happened, first on the demand side, we're just seeing uh, you know, more boards sort of look for specs that uh, besides gender diversity are just looking for more diversity and sometimes specify uh, racial diversity. We're partnering very closely with the Black Alumni Association um, at the Graduate School of Business. So for every board spec, uh, uh, we are, um, you know, also running it through their membership. We're working through them with the broader Black Alumni Association at Stanford. We want to bring into our slate as many diverse candidates as possible. And, and we're also starting to do some thought partnership with them in terms of you know, awareness uh, across Stanford alumni with our partner groups. We work with several private equity firms, venture capital firms, and, and search firms. Uh, how can we address this problem together uh, by doing some thought partnership and research work? So we're doing sort of mul a multi-factorial uh, effort. Now that's um, you know great that you're able to respond quickly and partner with existing organizations um, to approach the topic in an intersectional way. You know, as we think about um, ESG more broadly in the boardroom and the S standing for social, um, you know, I think the focus right now has really been on Blacks and perhaps uh, Latinx as well. And you know, here we all are um, as Asians on the panel. And you know, wondering as I think back to the fact that you know you didn't mention in the organization that I co-chaired when I was at Stanford Business School, which was the South Asian Student Association. Um, you know, what about Asians? Is there an elephant in the room on, on that topic at this point, team? And that's my question for you. Okay, so actually, I've been asked that quite a bit, and I think we need to be very cognizant and aware that if we don't proactively work now. Asians may be left behind. But we are elevating this issue with our congressman, um, both at the state level and other levels. And let's say, let's look at a data point. Let's look at board representation. Russell Reynolds just established and sent out the results of a study. And they said Asians, and I'm talking about uh, those of Indian descent, uh, like on this call, Chinese, Japanese, et cetera, right? Is we have the least representation among Blacks and Hispanics for the Fortune 250. Now, we talked about it and um, there's a bill right now in July 2nd of 2020, a bill that would impose a minimum number of directors from an underrepresented community, AB 979. And no later than the close of 2021, they have specifics on what kind of ethnic diversity they would like to see on the board. This is on top of the previous board when I worked with Senator Hannah Jackson on focus on women as diverse candidates. So the problem is when I talk to assembly member Chris Holden as an example, currently the bill defines a director from an underrepresented community. You mean an individual who's Afro-American, Hispanic, or Native Americans, not just Asian descent. And it is now in the Senate committee of rules, so stay tuned. So now we've got gender quotas, you know, working with Senator ha Hannah Jackson in, back in 2018, SB 8 through 6. And even that is, to this day, by some, it is the test of constitu constitutionality that it is now in the legislation now open before the court. But believe it or not, there are really, as used an example, there aren't that many companies who really need to comply with it because their jurisdiction and their establishment and structure is in Delaware. So if I look at the relatively small percentage of companies that would have to comply with Senator, Han, uh, Senator Hannah Jackson's bill, I'll look at those, even the amount of penalty that they're gonna say, if you don't have X amount of women, which is the previous bill, it's rather minuscule. And the main thing, many corporations are putting women on boards, not only because they see the business reason, and the penalty is relatively small, it could be a very bad PR issue, especially for those that are dependent on the women population, which as you well know, based on all these statistics, we have a huge purse string power. So yeah, we need to, we need to think about it. If this bill goes into pass, the one focused on ethnic diversity, but we're talking about three ethnic diverse 
board members, male or female, if the corporation's number of directors is nine or more, and they'd like to see two ethnic diverse candidates, if it's more than four but fewer than nine on the board, and at least one if the corporation's number of directors is four or fewer. So I'd say watch the space, whatever we could do at a groundswell, not only to help our sisters and brothers who are of other ethnicities such as Afro-American, Hispanic, we also to make sure that it's a broader net as well that includes us Asians on this call. So thank you for asking that very uh, timely question, Tina. Yeah, no, I appreciate the perspective and I, you know, in, in the role that I play, it's global, yeah. right? So I, I think often about the Davies report and the change that it yeah. uh, fueled in the UK and now the Parker review. And I'm happy to hear that this work is in process here as well. And it makes me proud to be a Californian. Um, we have a couple of last questions that we prepared for the panelists and then let's turn to Q&A from the audience. Um, you know, I think still in, in the topic of ESG, you know, with your background in healthcare and pharmaceuticals, Deepthi, I wanted to ask how COVID-19 has impacted board governance and what you are doing to be a good steward at this time. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, so because I have a healthcare background, uh, actually a clinical background, um, and I was on a bank board. <laughs> I was the first one to ask the CEO, what are we doing about COVID-19? Um, we This was at the border of lockdown. So California wasn't in lockdown yet. And the response was, yeah, it's going to be, you know, sure, we're keeping an eye on it. Uh, pretty soon, this became a real problem and we had to go into lockdown. Now, we are an essential business, right, with our branches, but we had to consider you know, the exposure of our employees. We um, actually got involved in so many different ways. The board has been, well, anyway, being a, being a um, sort of in the banking industry, we, we meet monthly, but the board was now doing some weekly stuff because we had to think about employee health, uh, maintaining a service level, going remote when we needed to. I mean, I told you they were interested in tech transformation, right? When I came on in January, this got accelerated by March because now, we had to enable our employees to work from home. So there was a lot to do in terms of, you know, security and, and um, systems and uh, making sure people had the working laptops. Um, there were PTO policies that we put in place to allow our employees to kind of take care of themselves or loved ones. Um, you know, PTO wouldn't mean anything, but then, uh, you know, maybe sometimes cash out on PTO. So we did some innovative things there. We had to think about member health. Um, so, you know, our members who are coming into our branches, how can we, we already have uh, digitally enabled banking, but we had to make it better. Uh, our call center volumes went up uh, immediately. So we, the board had to sort of put in some policies in place. Then we got involved in supporting businesses, you know, through the SBA programs that government was putting in place. So we got involved in the PPP program uh, to keep businesses alive, those incentives. We performed better, I'm proud to say, than you know some of the larger, sort of like the Wells Fargo's and Bank of America's of the world. Uh, for for entrepreneurs in the room, you probably know TechCU's name. We became a little bit of a buzz because people said, if you want a PPP loan, go to TechCU. I got a lot of calls from sort of friends who knew I was on the board. Um, we are also involved in loan forgiveness, supporting our members and businesses, whether it's mortgage loans or business loans, kind of giving them a little more time to deal with COVID-19. And, and uh, the board has played a really active role. We get daily updates from our uh, CEO. We are actively engaged in our retail bank with our chief retail banking officer and chief commercial banking officer. Uh, and, and I think it's all hands on deck uh, during COVID-19. Yeah, I imagine Chima and Anjali have similar stories to share. Um, I do want to just uh, make sure that we have time for uh, questions from the audience and then we can certainly engage further on this topic as well as the prior question, which I think is interesting for all of us to talk about. But uh, last but not least, I'd like to ask, um, ask you, Anjali, about the types of investments that Ivana Capital is making as we think about um, you know, the topic of gender specifically and then just ESG more broadly and, and the impact um, focus of, uh, of the topic. And you know, if, you're, if you're willing and able, maybe as well share with uh, of some of the work that you're doing with the Prime Minister. 
Sure, Tina. Um, very quickly, let me share a little bit about Avana and uh, our investment focus. Our, the belief behind Avana is that technology-led innovation and Silicon Valley, you know, we are in the heart of innovation and technology, that technology-led innovation when applied to scalable business models can actually solve very large problems at scale. And in markets and countries like India, we have some very significant large scale problems, livelihood, access, formalization, inclusion and inclusive growth, uh, health, education. And hence, again, technology led innovation when applied to scalable business models can lead to very significant financial outcomes, but importantly, very large development outcomes as well. So as a group of people and those of us who have come for, uh, together to create Avana, all of us come with fairly significant operating backgrounds and a very diverse set of experiences, whether as um, you know, in, in investing in running businesses, uh, we look across the four, in, in our minds, it's kind of four intermingled lenses of startup and entrepreneurship and innovation, the large corporate ecosystem, which really provides the scale and, and uh, in some ways kind of the supply chains that can lead to scalability, policy, which in, again, in markets like India and certainly like the US as well, plays a very significant role, say, for example, fintech or health tech and how regulation can either help or hinder. So policy. So we are engaging uh, deeply with policy. And finally, the world of development and impact. So these four worlds we actually bring together into Havana. Um, with the prime minister, given the impact of COVID, we've been involved with uh, helping to shape and fingers crossed, hopefully it will take shape but helping to shape a livelihood of completely cutting edge, um, cloud-based, AI-led matching and more platform for livelihood access. So to create a portal for blue and gray collar workers to be able to access livelihood and beyond livelihood and jobs, gain access to the whole sort of plethora of government services, direct benefit transfers, uh, the Ayushman Bharat health scheme, education schemes, uh, insurance, financial services and credit, as well as everything, all the energy that the private sector has to offer through jobs and through other skilling programs and so on. So we presented yesterday, it's gone very well. I think the, the and I must say it was very energizing to see the deep interest that the PM took in the two issues of livelihood and he particularly focused on gender inclusive workplaces. That's terrific to hear the impact that you're having, right, both through the fund and the work you're doing more broadly um, for a diverse population, in this case, gender, as well as, you know, we, we don't often talk about it, but uh, socioeconomics is an important part of the equation mm -hmm. as well, and including that perspective. So thank and you Tina, to if all I may of add, you know, at Avana, yeah. at Avana, we have actually seen that it is entirely possible to bring both gender and inclusivity into the mainstream investing discussion. All our companies, when we raise the question of, do you want more women in your workforce? Do you want more women in your leadership team? They always say, yeah, sure. And we help them get there. So that's one way to drive diversity. But at the same time, these are massively successful, very, very successful entrepreneurs and innovative, innovative companies. So I like that, I bringing it into good. the mainstream, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going to take some questions from the audience and then maybe come back to each of you for closing remarks if you have uh, any final thoughts you'd like to, to share. Um, and, and thank you very much for you know, all of your comments this far. It's been just a fun panel and, and happy that we're all making this connection. So the first question from the audience is, um, sexual harassment is the pandemic now. And at the same time, there's a lot of job insecurity and many have to live with it um, especially if they are a single or main bread earner. There's no specific question here, but you know, I think the question is probably, you know, what is your perspective on, you know, basically the Me Too movement and everything that's happened around it um, from a governance standpoint? I can I can lead with that with uh, some recent experiences. Uh, not personal, but at the companies that I've been involved with. Uh, so I think um, the first thing that I've seen successfully happen, and we do this at TechCU, sort of the most significant board I'm a part of, uh, the, it starts with training, right? The training and the culture we set around sexual harassment. 
um, I, our board, uh, again, since I recently joined this board, I was taken through the training. Um, we have pretty extensive training, uh, not only for the board, but then sort of C-suite and all the way down. And uh, even in the company I recently joined, which is Astellas Pharmaceuticals, same thing. I saw the same rigor and training and encouraging sort of voice. I have in a couple of companies I've been involved with seen actually very swift and immediate action, but very thorough investigation. So there has been an incident where some sexual harassment was report, uh, reported. Uh, that company hired a, an investigator, did a formal review, uh, you know, very thorough. Um, but when it was determined that it was truly sexual harassment, action was taken immediately. And so, uh, I think it is the board's role and, and senior executives role to create that training, create room for that voice. Uh, and, and speaking of job security, right? The victim is not the one who is at risk for losing the job if you create the right culture. And, and so, it, I mean, I think boards have a large role to play in, in making sure that that culture and, and permission to voice your concern is there. And the action is swift and fair. Then it kind of sets that, dynamo of people feeling safe and then though the perpetrators to kind of be careful you know you know i absolutely agree with that at our board level um any sexual harassment either perceived or actual is is investigated and for those of which there really is an act of sexual harassment we found out that's only the tip of the iceberg the reason the board gets intimately involved in this and working with management and having an independent person look at it is because if you look at sexual harassment and all these other things, what makes a company critical and sustainable and grow and be able to attract and retain the right people is the culture. The culture of the company defines, defines what kind of company it is. And sexual harassment is just one example of things that could tear down a great company culture. Now the board and management together, they have to define what is the corporate culture and that's very difficult. But that is, that is an absolute great question uh, to ask, especially with the Me Too movement and everything else going on. Both, um, you know, and I think culture is the main point that I'm teasing yeah. out here, right? Setting the tone from the top and culture more broadly, mm -hmm. I think is a really important uh, role of the board at this time. Um, yeah. Anjali, any final you know, get, thoughts on culture as we wrap up and close up? I'm not seeing any other questions from the audience, so maybe parting thoughts. <laughs> so culture eats strategy for breakfast, as that book says, but it also eats strategy for lunch and likely for dinner also. Um, and we actually, I, I think many of us are, um, are very analytical in our approach, right? So we tend to think about systems and processes and policies and, uh, and that's, that to me is actually the hardware. So the hardware of an organization or an institution is all of that. Culture is the software. And if you do not have the right software, the operating system, the applications, then the hardware is just that. It's just machinery. So hence, um, to a issue of diversity, of engine, and to an extreme harassment, and it can be sexual harassment, it can be any kind of harassment, actually. It can be sort of slurs on race, on caste, on gender, including. Uh, to make that completely unacceptable is to create a very respectful, a very lively, but respectful work environment where the different is celebrated. Um, so I think the culture piece to me is critical. It's the heart, it's the software that runs an organization. I love that. And as we close here, you know, I'll just comment that uh, we have a similar model as we talk about diversity and inclusion and diversity being the hardware and inclusion being the software, which is uh, one part of culture. And I hope that uh, you know, as we part ways here, I just wanted to thank you for creating these kinds of cultures from the board level and setting the tone from the top. It's really been a pleasure. Um, and on behalf of Ty, thank you very much for the time that you've taken to share with you, your, with us your thoughts today. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.